1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 31. And the Bible reads, I protest by the rejoicing which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. With the help of the Holy Ghost, I like to preach the title he's given me. You must die. You must die. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. We thank you that you're God who reigns on high and that there is none like you, Lord. Right now we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property above and below. That no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be in one mindset and one accord. That we may worship you in sincerity and truth. That the Holy Ghost may move as it so desires, Lord. That we would all be desiring the same thing. To have you speak to our hearts. Speak to our minds, that we may remember your word throughout the week, but even greater than that, that it would take root in our hearts, that our lives would be changed even more into the very image of Jesus Christ. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. When we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 31, it's not an unfamiliar passage by any means. We've heard this verse stated time and time again. And we have especially heard the last part quoted over and over and over. The words of the Apostle Paul where he wrote, I die daily. When we look at this passage and what the Holy Ghost has for us tonight, there's a particular point that he is trying to make for each one of us. And that is that we need to get a hold of God like never before. But we need, and the way to do that is we need to make sure that we are completely dead to several things. That we have died to sin is the very first thing that I see on the list. Is that before we can be dead in Christ, we must first be dead to sin. And we go back all the way to to the beginning, back in the garden, we find that Adam and Eve are strolling along, and we are looking at a perfect environment. There is no sin in the world at this time, but it is pure, it is holy, it is clean. We find that they are still in the very image of God, more so than we are in our mortal flesh right now, because the Shekinah glory of God was their clothing. The light of God clothed them. They did not know sin. It was a perfect environment. It it was a perfect situation, but we find that the serpent comes along, and he'll creep him along with his leg, and he starts talking to Eve and telling her a few things and starts getting her sidetracked. And you know what? It's not long before we find that sin has entered into the world. Did it enter in through sin, Eve? Absolutely not. It didn't enter in through Eve, but rather it entered in through the one who knew better, the one who knew exactly what he was doing. Eve was in in the whole thing. The Bible says that he was deceived, but when Adam partook of the fruit, fruit, he knew exactly what he was doing. He knew he was going against the very commandment of God, for he heard the words of God himself, saying, Thou shalt not eat of the tree, the fruit of the tree of the garden of the life. And we find that Adam is the one that partook. He was the one that was ahead of Eve. He was the one that was not deceived. And through Adam, sin entered into the world. This perfect environment when thou started to grow thorns and started to grow thistles. We find that at this point that not only did sin enter into the world, but because sin entered, entered into the world, so did disease and so did death. What was once perfect is now polluted. And because of that, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You have sinned and I have sinned. All because of Adam. We're not perfect. We were not born perfect. But rather we were born. We were scarred. Because sin was in the world. And it was passed on to us. And because of that, this very sin nature resides within the mortal flesh. Constantly trying to get us to do those things which are evil. That is why we are to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. All because sin entered into the world. James chapter 4 verse 4 states, Ye all adulterers and adulteresses, 
Know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you realize that we are living in the world where the church world is hell is friends with the world? It is living side by side. If we would line up the church with the world, they would say they may not be exactly the same. Well, those things that preachers used to preach against and say it was sin, the world is now saying that it's all right. It's all right to have homosexuals on the platform because to preach anything else would be a hate crime. But I hate to tell you that the Bible is the Bible. And if God said that it is sin, it is still sin today. And it doesn't matter what society says. It doesn't matter what of the church denomination says and the word of God says that it is sin it is still sin. You cannot walk alongside the world and expect to be right with God. Church, we cannot have sin in our life because it will keep us from God but rather we must die to the old sinful flesh. We must push it far, far away and say, Lord, I don't want to do those things that I used to do. Lord, I ask you to remove all my sin from my life. I want to be molded and transformed Order to your very image. The Bible states in Matthew chapter 6 and 24 that no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and man. You realize that on the day of judgment, there's going to be plenty of people that sat in the pew. There's going to be plenty of people that did miracles for Christ. There's going to be plenty of ministers that stand before God and say, have I not done this? And have I not done that? But basically, God's going to say, no, you might have done those things in my name, but you were a friend of the world. I knew you not. You did those things which the world wanted to do. Oh, you may not have done it to the same extent, but just because the church world went a little bit farther, you went a little bit farther. The world got a little bit more fit, sinful, so you got a little bit sinful. You did not stick by my word. You decided to make your own path. I said straight is the narrow is the way. But you say, you know what? Lord, I can make my own way. I can make my own detour. And for that very reason, the Lord will say, depart from me, thou worker of iniquity. I never knew you. You didn't stay on the straight and narrow, but rather you created your own path. You thought that you were as bad as the world. It does not matter while you classify sin in God's eyes, sin is sin. And all it takes is one sin to keep you out of heaven. It doesn't matter if you murdered a person or if you just told a little white lie. Sin is sin, and you are going to be kept out of hell because uh, out of heaven for it. We must die to sin if we have not already. The next thing I see that we must die to is we must die to distractions. When we look at life, life itself can get busy. It can get troublesome. You realize that not everything that goes wrong in your life is because of something that you did. There are people that are in our lives, friends, family, co-workers, that maybe our life is a little bit rough and maybe it's a little bit tough, and it's not because of anything we've done, but it's because of something they did. You realize that life comes with its own problems. Love, we sometimes we're not sure how we're going to pay a bill, so we worry about it, and we pick it up, and we carry it with us. The devil will bring distractions into our own life to keep us from God. The Bible states in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7 to cast all your cares upon him for he cared for you. You realize that the devil will come in and whisper those thoughts in your ears. He will whisper those distractions in your ears. Well, what about this situation? Well, what about that situation? There comes a point when we have to realize that all he's doing is distracting us from the things of God and realize that we have to die to those distractions and say, devil, get me beside behind me, for I have placed all my cares in my God's hands. You cannot bog me down. You can't drag me down with this situation. For I know that if I cast all my cares upon God, He will take care of the situation. Sometimes it's not just problems in life, but rather it's just a matter of being busy. Sometimes we are just so busy with things that are going on around us that we can't pay attention to what God's trying to tell us. 
We don't have time to sit down and read the Bible the way that we're supposed to. We don't have time to kneel down and pray the way we're supposed to. Sometimes if we would let the devil, he will bring stuff in to keep us so busy that I don't have time to go to church. It's not because of something that's a necessity, but rather there's just little things I creep in that keep me so busy. Oh, I have to do this and I have to do that. Oh, I have to make sure that the toilet is clean and the house is kept. Oh, I have to mow my grass and make sure it's kept. Oh, and we'll skip church to do it. The devil will bring these distractions into our life to keep us from God. And it's working in the world we're living in. And there's a story told of the devil who got together in a business meeting one day with his minions. And they were trying to find out how we can get the Christians to take them down. And the one was saying, well, we would tell them that there is no God. And the devil said, you know what? That you may try that, but that's not going to work. They already know that there's a God. They've seen his power and work. They've seen his hand in their own life. They're never going to believe that lie. They already know that there's a God. They said, all right, they won't just tell them that the Bible isn't true. They go, the devil goes, you know what? That's a nice thought. But they already know that the word of God is true. You're not going to get them with that evolution nonsense. For they know that in the beginning, God said was the word. And that's good enough for them. They don't have to try to add to it. They're not going to believe you. Finally, one time somebody goes, i got the best idea of all. Let's keep them too busy that they don't have time for God. We'll keep them entertained with music. We'll get them into music. We'll get them on the TV. We'll get them on the internet. We'll get them into sporting events. We'll make it that their children who are involved in sports at school have to go on a Sunday. We'll find that their grandchildren are in soccer, so they have to miss church to go to a game. We'll find that the Super Bowl can't be played on a Saturday, but we'll have to play it on a Sunday night when there's church. We'll keep them so busy and keep them so distracted that they'll forget all about God. They may not forget about reading the Bible so much. They might not get so busy and caught up that they don't pray, but we'll keep them busy enough that they don't pray the way they're supposed to. We keep them too busy that they don't go out and tell our neighbor about Jesus. We'll keep them so busy doing this and doing that that when they come to church, they're too exa exhausted to get anything from the preacher. Oh, we need to make sure that we're dying to sin. But we also got to make sure that we're dying to the distractions of this world. That we are wise to the debatables of the enemy. Because he's keeping us so distracted that we no longer have prayer meetings in church. Because we are too busy with life. We are too busy doing our own thing. If we go and have a prayer meeting in church, that's too much church. Because we got to do this and we got to do that. What is that all of? That's the devil creeping in. Trying to keep the saints of God busy. Trying to keep the saints of God powerless. Because he knows that the moment that they hit the knees, that is not a moment of weakness. But in that moment, they're getting strength. In that moment, they're getting power from the throne. In that moment, the river of living water is boiling a little bit more. It's boiling up a little bit stronger. It's getting a little bit deeper. It's getting a little bit more powerful. It's getting a little bit clearer as a sin, as those business, as those things in our life that would keep us bogged down, that would keep us from God. It's being washed out, and we are being transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. But we realize that we can there be that we need a God is distractions. We're getting a little bit closer to finding out what revival truly is. When we get those things out of our life, we're slowly getting God to see Him move more and more, not just in our own life, but in the lives of our family, in the lives of our children, in the lives of those in our church. We'll see our church grow. We'll see our community touch for God. Even if they start coming against us, let us fear God. For those that can deal with conviction sometimes flash out, but maybe rejoice knowing that the more that we die to sin, the more we die to the distractions of this world and the distractions of the enemy, that God's going to move and do something more powerful and mightier and greater than what this church has ever seen or known in its entire existence. And they'll turn this world backside up. The last thing I see is that we have to die to self. We can already say, 
I have died to sin. I no longer do those old things. The old man has passed away. And all things have been, all things have been made new. You can say, I've become wise to the distractions of the enemy. I've got wise to his, his temptations. And I've learned a long time to flee youthful lust. I've learned a long time to rebuke him in the name of Jesus and command him to go. But have we died to self? Have we died to self? You know what? One of the biggest battles that will be throughout our entire Christian life? The flesh, right here. It wants to do its own thing. It wants to do those things which are not convenient. And it doesn't matter how close we get to God, there still will be times where it flares up and tries to take control. And we still got to put it down. Even Jesus battled with self. In Matthew 26, 39 through 44, and he went a little bit farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And here, and he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray. That ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, for the flesh is weak. And he went away again the second time. Not just once. He goes twice. And pray, saying, O oh my Father, if this cup may not pass from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them, and he went away again. The third time he went away again. And prayed the third time, saying the same words. You realize that even Jesus had a battle with self. If we would place ourselves in his situation, would we want to die knowing that that was our fate? No. But it was the will of the Father. Jesus in himself, he didn't want to die. But it was God's will. He had to die to self and say, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. Regardless. We battle with self every single day. There are desires of our own heart that we find ourselves doing and saying, Lord, I don't want to do those things. Maybe it's not sin, but it's something that will keep us from God. Something that we enjoy doing. It might not be sin at all, but it's something that's taking up our time when we could be praying when we could be fasting, when we could be reading our word, we must die to self. That's why it's important to pray. Lord, take away the desires of my heart and give me your desires. That I may die to self, Lord. Because, Lord, I will be transformed into your image even farther. The desires of our heart can be are deceitfully wicked. And we don't even know them sometimes. But we have to die to self and say, Lord, reveal these things to me that I may do them no more. Reveal them to me so when they arise, I can push them aside. Say, Lord, I just want to be transformed in your image even more. Are these desires entertainment? Are they hobbies? These desires can be absolutely anything. They don't have to be bad. But if they keep us from the things of God, if they take up time that we can be spending in prayer, time spent in fasting, time spent in reading the Word of God, we need to make sure that we die to self daily. As Sister Beth comes to the piano, over in Rome, right next to the forum, before the forum was even built, there was a spring. And it's called the Maiden Spring. It wasn't just nothing big or grand like we would think of the Mississippi. 
but it was pure. Well, the water was like crystal. It was like nothing else around. It wasn't this big, mighty thing, but yet this little crystal stream, this fountain that was natural, inspired musicians, and songs were written about it. It inspired poets, and poems were written about it. This little spring, this little fountain that was pure and crystal was the inspiration for all kinds of arts and works. But as the Roman Empire expanded and time went on, debris started flowing in around that fountain. And in time, it got lost until modern times. They started excavating around the forum, breaking out the stones, clearing the dirt. But all those poems, all those songs about this maiden's battle, they stood the test of time. And they went digging for this mountain. And they removed, I don't know how much debris from this fountain. I couldn't tell you how many weeks of work it took, Sister Tina, of them just digging right around where the spring should have been, to clearing all this debris, Brother Craig, that piled up over tired. Until one day, one worker while I was digging, up through the ground shot, shot this crystal clear water. It was the maiden's house. I don't know who needs to do tonight, but somebody needs to remove the, the mountain from their fountain. Maybe it's all of us. But God is telling us tonight that you must die. You must die to sin. You must die to distractions. You must die to self. If we really want to see revival, if we really want to see God move, we need to make take mountain off the fountain that we may have living water spring forth like never before because those are the cleanest purest waters in this entire universe those are the cleanest purest waters that ever existed the living water of the Holy Ghost and flows from each one of us is that your desire to suck tonight to die to self I the distractions to make sure that all sin is removed from our lives? Is that the desire of your heart tonight to remove the mountain from your fountain? If that's your desire tonight, why don't we find ourselves